and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, welcome to the Islamic Information and Dawah Center's monthly lecture series entitled Islam and Other Religions. Tonight's topic will be war and peace in, uh, in Islam and the world religions. Um, so with that being said, my name is Sasha Purse, and it is my honor and my dear pleasure to be your MC for tonight. So, how's everybody doing tonight? Are you guys awake? I can't hear you guys. How is everybody doing tonight? Alhamdulillah. 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 So with that being said, um, we're going to have a quick few rundowns of how tonight's going to go, a quick rundown of tonight's lecture. Um, we're going to start off at about, it's now 6.30 to about uh, 7.20, so we'll have a 50-minute lecture. Um, following that, we'll have a brief 40-minute Q&A section. And then we'll have Isha pair will be about 8 o'clock, so we'll break for that for a little bit. And then following that, we'll have some refreshments. Um, so before we get into the lecture topic, I'd just like to give a little bit of background about our guest speaker today. Um, his name is Dr. Shabir Ali. He has his PhD in Quranic interpretations, a master's in comparative religions. And he's also been blessed to travel the world in many places to talk about his passion, God, Islam, the Quran, and comparative religions. He appears as a resident speaker weekly on the in-house program, Let the Quran Speak, and any past episodes, if you guys are curious about it, check it out. You can check it out at www.quranspeaks.com. Uh, with that being said, guys, give a please, can I get a warm and humble welcome to Dr. Shabir Ali. Begin by praising our Creator and Fashioner, and ask Him to send peace and blessings upon all of His prophets and messengers, all of the righteous people throughout time. I ask Him to bless all of us here tonight, our families, our friends, our loved ones, uh, and I ask Him to bless our gathering uh, so that uh, our understanding of the world's religions will increase, and uh, we will better understand our own uh, place in the world and our own place in relation to uh, the Good Creator. Uh, I've set my stopwatch so that I uh, hopefully will not go over time. I know we're a little bit pressed for time. I want to get some clarification from Sasha. Sasha, did you say that the refreshment no, will be after the open. prayer? Or did you? Again. Yes? So, okay, so that means we have, have a little bit more time to, to speak and also to take your questions. Okay, uh, so uh, having uh, praised uh, our creator and fashioner and asked, uh, having asked, uh, him to send peace and blessings upon all the prophets and messengers. Let me get into the topic proper. The topic, as you know, is war and peace in the world's religions. Uh, the, the topic itself, war and peace, uh, uh, it, it is a famous topic in that uh, Leo Tolstoy had uh, written a book entitled War and Peace, and uh, since then the, the words war and peace came to be used in this particular way, in this order. And uh, uh, recently, I came across a book entitled War and Peace in the World Religions, uh, edited by Perry Schmidt uh, Leukel, and uh, that has become the inspiration for the topic of tonight's lecture. Uh, so what, we wanna, what I want to say in tonight's lecture has been covered in greater detail in this book. It's a collection of essays uh, contributed by uh, some experts uh, on, on the world's religions, and they here collected it together in that one book. I'll try to summarize some of that information and add to that uh, my own uh, interest and, and knowledge uh, of the subject. Now, when we think about uh, the world's religions, naturally uh, we think about the spirituality, we think about being close to our creator, our God, our fashioner, and uh, we think about service to humankind, and, and one does not th suppose that war uh, could have anything uh, to do with religion. In our modern times, uh, people have uh, uh, connected Islam somehow with violence, often because uh, there are some misguided Muslims who go about uh, killing themselves, killing innocent civilians, and they say that they're doing so in the name of Islam and in the name of God. And may they may even shout Allahu Akbar, which means God is the greatest, while they do so. 
uh, to the utter despair of other Muslims because we see that they use our religious symbols, our terminology, uh, and connect, they connect our symbols and terminology with acts which we know to be contrary to our religion. So how does all of this figure in? Uh, let us understand then what the world's religions have to say about war and peace, and specifically, what does Islam have to say uh, about war and peace? Some uh, writers have uh, looked at, at the world situation in general, and uh, with that broad survey in mind, they have come to see that uh, somehow uh, war is built into the fabric of human existence. Karen Armstrong has written a book entitled Fields of Blood. And what she has shown in that book is that as far back as we can trace human beings, uh, there has been uh, some tension between human beings. But she says that uh, there was a time when human beings needed each other. So rather than be at war with each other, they tried to, to support each other and defend each other. This was especially so in the hunting stage, when in order to eat, uh, humans had to band together and attack animals uh, as a group. And, and only by working in unison uh, could they conquer the animals, uh, could they get something to eat. But once uh, humans uh, came into uh, the agrarian age, where farming was the means of uh, sustenance, then there, there were questions about who was going to store the remaining grain after you've harvested, who's going to store the remaining grain and control that grain, because who controls the grain has power over people. And naturally there were struggles uh, over the control of the resources, and that uh, is what we know in history uh, to be war. Uh, so war is very old, and uh, it has uh, at its very core nothing really to do with religion, but we can say that the world's religions respond to this uh, basic human situation and the world's religions try, each in their own way, uh, to regulate war, to insist on peace, and uh, to uh, call people away from some of the most uh, dastardly acts that might be done uh, in a state of war. Keith Ward is a professor of uh, philosophy at Oxford University. He has written a book entitled, Is Religion, is Religion Dangerous? He is responding to uh, the frequent uh, statement of uh, the new neo-atheists, the, the modern day period atheists, uh, who are uh, in one way or another trying to show that religion is something bad and human beings had better off, uh, had, had better uh, give up religion altogether, and they will be better off for doing so. So one of the things they claim is that religion is dangerous. Uh, people, because of their religious convictions, will kill each other. And some of that is true, but uh, Keith Ward uh, shows in, in that book, is, religious, is Religion Dangerous?, that in fact the opposite is true. That religion actually calls people towards good things and away from violence. And even without religion, people have actually inflicted horrendous violence on each other. And he points uh, to uh, specifically the uh, two world wars. These two world wars that we have witnessed in the last uh, century were not religion-based uh, wars, but they were secular wars. And uh, some religious people may have had something to do with these wars, but at the core, uh, these are wars uh, without uh, consideration for religion. And in these wars, uh, hundreds and thousands of people die. So you cannot blame religion uh, for the wars that have uh, taken place in human history. On the other hand, one might even say that uh, it takes a certain degree of irreligion, a, a lack of religion uh, and an indifference to religion, even a hostility to religion, uh, it, it takes that sort of mindset for people to go to war with each other and to kill in large numbers as we have seen them uh, doing. If we think of the bombs drop, dropping on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, they, these are not uh, bombs coming from any uh, particularly uh, identifiable religious group, though some of the people may have professed a particular uh, religion, for example, the then President of the United uh, States. Uh, but in dropping these bombs, he was not fighting a religious war. He was not prompted by religion to kill the Japanese people, but he's prompted by some other interests 
which have nothing to do with religion. So in the end, it is unfair to religion to say that religion is dangerous, and uh, rather we must uh, seek the origins of war in, in a more basic sort of uh, human uh, situation, as Karen Armstrong and others have argued. Now, turning to the world's uh, religions, uh, if I had uh, uh, given this lecture, uh, let's say, uh, a month ago, before reading this uh, present book in, in some detail, I, I might have said that uh, Hinduism is one of the most peaceful religions uh, on earth. Uh, however, in, in reading the details, uh, I, my mind has been open to uh, another dimension here. We're all familiar with uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who is called uh, you know, a great soul. That's what his uh, title Mahatma means, uh, a great, great soul. Gandhi being his, his name. And uh, his, his greatness is registered in the world uh, for his nonviolence and uh, his uh, opposition to British rule by, by peaceful protest rather than resorting to any uh, violence. And this is certainly admirable. And because he was a Hindu, people have connected his nonviolence with Hinduism. However, according to this book, uh, Gandhi's nonviolence is actually uh, connected not with Hinduism, uh, but uh, with Jainism. Jainism is a religion that actually broke off uh, from Hinduism in the 6th century BC, uh, headed by Mahavira. And that religion actually stresses nonviolence. The term for nonviolence is ahimsa. And uh, that was one of the main considerations, ahimsa, to the extent uh, that uh, a uh, a Mahavira uh, a priest, uh, a, a giant priest, uh, may uh, sweep the floor be before his feet so that he does not accidentally step on uh, some uh, uh, little creatures as he goes. Uh, some may even uh, brush the, the seat that they're going to sit on with the same consideration they don't want to sit on something to harm uh, something. So that's uh, certainly an admirable quality but that's in the Jainism, it's not in Hinduism. Jainism has remained a, a minor religion. It's not what uh, would be classified as one of the great uh, world's, uh, world religions. So among the great world religions, we can think about Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, some of the Chinese uh, religions, and uh, then in terms of the Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In calling these religions great, we don't mean to be biased and to favor some religions over some others, but they're classified this way because they have a great amount of following, uh, large uh, numbers of fo uh, followers uh, throughout the world. Uh, Judaism probably has the least amount of followers uh, among these just named, uh, but uh, nevertheless, because of its close connection with Christianity and Islam, uh, and uh, the difficulty in explaining Christianity and Islam without uh, first explaining Judaism, and uh, Judaism naturally uh, comes to be represented as one of the world's uh, great uh, religions along with the others. So now, to continue the discussion then, uh, we want to uh, pick up where I left off uh, before talking about uh, Jainism uh, to continue with Hinduism. Hinduism uh, is, uh, like many of the world's religions, uh, on the one hand, stressing the importance of peace, but on the other hand, accepting uh, the validity of war when this is, especially when it is a last uh, resort. Uh, the Hindu scriptures are many. Uh, one of the scriptures is the Mahabharata, and uh, within the Mahabharata, there is a smaller scripture known as the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which uh, is uh, something often published uh, as a separate document and read as a separate uh, scripture, Bhagavad Gita, which means uh, the Song of God. And uh, in this uh, poem called the Bhagavad Gita, which is very popular and widely read and followed and believed in among Hindus, uh, the story is uh, shown of a, a prince, Arjuna. Arjuna is uh, going to war. And uh, in the midst of the war, uh, he is uh, having second thoughts because he sees that on the other side, the people that he will end up killing, many of them are his relatives. And, and he, he wants to know, should, should he continue this war? Would that be just and fair and right? Or should he seize in his tracks? Well, it so turns out 
that his charioteer is Krishna. And Krishna in the Hindu uh, pantheon uh, is uh, one of the gods. He is a manifestation, uh, an avatar uh, of uh, one of the gods. So Krishna is here in the guise of the charioteer of Arjuna the prince. And they have this conversation now with each other. And Krishna advises the, the prince uh, to continue to go to war. Why? What is the logic? What is the uh, rationale behind going to war? In, in the Hindu system of thought, uh, there are four ideas that are stressed. One is, and, and the primary idea is Dharma. Uh, dharma is uh, almost like the way of things, the, the way in which you find the world. It is like this. And basically, the idea is you have to accept it. And then the, the other idea is what people more famously know. They, they know. You know the word karma, right? Karma. So this has become almost an English word. And uh, sometimes in the movies you see that somebody has done something bad and then immediately something hits him and somebody says, oh, that's instant karma. That means uh, you, you get the results of what you do, right? That's the idea of karma. So as for the first idea, the lesser known one, this is called Dharma, and it is the way of things. It's almost like what Muslims refer to when they, when they use the word Qadr, or al qada or al qadr uh, the, the way in which God has determined things, and some people think you just have to accept that, and you can't really change that. And uh, in the Hindu thought, the, the best you can do is to go along with that flow, and, and, and align yourself with the Dharma. So, what uh, Krishna is basically saying uh, to his uh, devotee, Ar Ar Arjuna the prince, is that you should accept the Dharma. Now, where does the Dharma place uh, someone like Arjuna the prince? In Hindu thought, uh, people are subdivided into various castes. The highest caste is the Brahman. This, this is the priestly caste. Below the Brahmins is the Kshatriya, or the warrior class. Uh, so Arjuna is from the warrior class. He's from the he is a prince, and being a prince, he necessarily is from that warrior class. And the best he can do is to be a good warrior. He has to fulfill the role that life has given to him. He so happens to have been born in the warrior class. He just simply has to be a warrior. He cannot turn away from his destiny, to put it this way. He must fulfill that. So there is an acceptance in, in Hindu thinking that uh, uh, war is uh, a necessary part of life. Not everybody will go to war. There are four uh, castes of people, the Brahmins, who will not go to war. They are the priests, the Kshatriyas who will go to war, uh, the Vaishavas who have the responsibility for trade, uh, and uh, finally the Shudras, or the, you know, the ones at the bottom of that uh, rank who will perform the lowly occupations. And of course we find the reality being that many people do not uh, find themselves in one of these classes, so they become outclassed, uh, or, or outcasts. And uh, this becomes a real problem in India where people uh, would consider the, the fourth in, in rank to be lowest of the low, and then the outcasts to be even lower still. So this is unimaginably uh, low and that presents a continuous difficulty. But to our subject tonight, it is clear then that in Hindu thinking, uh, the uh, war becomes uh, accepted as a norm uh, to be carried out. Of course, there are going to be restrictions uh, in, in the way in which war is carried out, but uh, it is uh, accepting war as a fact of life. If we move now to Buddhism, and Buddhism also, uh, comes to be known in the West as a very peaceful religion. And uh, here too, if I was giving this lecture a month ago without reading the book in detail, uh, I, I would have said also that Buddhism is a very peaceful religion. In fact, some people may have heard me saying in some previous lectures uh, uh, some such good things about Hinduism and Buddhism. And I don't hesitate even tonight to say good things about religions that I do not subscribe to. Uh, we must accept uh, what, it, what is right and, uh, and what is true and what is just, regardless of where it happens to be. 
But uh, as th this book explains, there are two approaches within uh, Buddhism. Uh, one is the approach uh, of, uh, of, of a person who has nothing to do with politics. So that, uh, that approach is basically to uh, just concentrate on your own uh, sort of devotions and uh, not to engage in any conflict. So you either engage or you disengage. Both approaches are within uh, Buddhism and we can see that uh, some of the followers of Buddhism uh, have actually followed either this approach or that approach. It so happens, as we can see more generally, even when we come to Christianity, uh, that uh, these two approaches exist across the board. There are some people who are involved in politics, and for them, uh, war becomes often a necessity. Uh, and some people who are not involved in that, they withdraw from the world, or they're just simply minding their own business, they go about their daily lives, and uh, they do not see any reason for they themselves to be concerned uh, with either engaging it or even knowing anything about war. They just continue to live their lives day to day. But uh, in Buddhist uh, thought, we, we also find that uh, there is the necessity uh, to deal with evil, especially when evil is manifest in a political situation. What are you going to do, for example, with uh, a, a, a rogue politician? or in, in, in those days, rogue kings and, and, and governors and Caesars and so on. Uh, naturally, uh, some people will have to defend uh, the weak and the downtrodden uh, against those uh, tyrants. And uh, that too falls within the purview of religion uh, to take care of that. In uh, Buddhism and, and, and in looking at Buddhism and Hinduism, we're looking basically at religions that came out of India. So let's move over now to uh, the Chinese uh, religions. And here we see that uh, Chinese religions are uh, connected with uh, philosophy, uh, more so than some of the other religious systems. Other religious systems have a lot to do with devotions to gods and goddesses and uh, things spiritual. But Chinese religions have tended to be very practical and connected with the philosophy of life. We see this especially in the teachings of Kung Fu Tzu. And uh, in, in Chinese religions, uh, the emphasis has been largely not on a particular truth to defend, uh, as we see sometimes being defended in other religious systems, which sometimes, of course, is connected with the wars uh, of religion. Uh, but they think that the prime importance is not a religious truth, but the prime importance is to stabilize government. You need to have a stable government uh, and that hierarchical arrangement, the top-down sort of approach, uh, where the governor is thought to be uh, approved by the heaven, which they refer to as uh, Tian. So they think that uh, the heaven somehow approves of the governor and then that governor gives laws which are uh, just and fair and people should just simply support that government. But also in Chinese thought, and we find it even in the writings of uh, Kung Fu Tzu, the, the Analects, and other ancient uh, writings of, uh, of Chinese religions, that uh, you could conceivably have uh, a, a, a politician uh, or a governor who is not really uh, approved by heaven. And how will you know the difference? Well, you will know the difference by their conduct and behavior. If, if one of them is behaving right, you know that he has the approval of heaven. Uh, but if one of them is behaving wrong, especially oppressing the people, well then that one is, does not have the approval of heaven and such a one needs to be removed. And to remove uh, such a, a person often involves the violent struggle and uh, uh, the leaders of uh, uh, Chinese uh, thought uh, have said that yes, you can kill uh, within such a violent struggle because you are working towards a greater good, a greater end. So having come this far, having surveyed Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, and Chinese religions among the world's great religions, we are seeing a repeated trend that uh, on the whole, people want to be at peace and live in peace with each other, uh, and they happen to be religious people, even if they're not religious people, that's basically what human beings want, but at the same time, they have to deal with the reality of conflict on the ground. They have to deal with the reality of tyranny, and oppression, 
and uh, a solution has to be sought for tyranny and oppression, and just simply saying we live at peace is not going to get rid of the oppression. It may work in some cases, like for example in, in Gandhi's uh, use of nonviolent uh, protest against the British, uh, but it doesn't always work, and mostly it does not seem to work. Mostly, if you let the tyrants have their way, they will continue uh, to oppress the weak and the downtrodden, and they will continue to profit thereby. They enjoy life, the rest of people suffer, and somebody has got to do something. Now turning to the what we call Western religions and the study of the world's religions, we have three main religions here, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Judaism is based largely on uh, the sacred scriptures of Judaism, uh, which uh, is the first part of the Christian Bible. Uh, Christians refer to it as the Old Testament, uh, but uh, a Jewish person will refer to it as the Tanakh, Tanakh which is uh, an acronym made up of the beginning letters uh, of, uh, of three words, Torah, uh, Ketuvim, and Nabiim. Uh, the, 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 the Torah, which Muslims know to be the book of Musa alayhi salam, the book from God, uh, the Ketubim, uh, the, the, um, the books, so the writings, you might say, uh, and uh, the, the prophets. So, so there are prophetic books within that collection of scripture. So their scripture is not just one continuous book written by one individual from beginning to end. It is a collection of a variety of writings. Five books referred to as the Torah, a number of books referred to as the, writing, uh, the writings, and a number of books referred to as prophetic books. They come together to form uh, what they call the uh, Torah, Ketuvim, Nabiim. They combine these, use the initial letters for them, to make the word Tanakh, they say this is our sacred scripture, it's called Tanakh. Now, in those sacred uh, scriptures, which Christians still, still call the Old Testament, uh, we find uh, instructions about peace and war. And one can find instructions about loving your neighbor, uh, being kind to other people, uh, being at peace, and so on. But uh, there is uh, a large number of verses in the Hebrew Bible, now I'm calling the Tanakh the Hebrew Bible because the main language in which it was written is Hebrew, and it's also referred to by academic scholars as the Hebrew Bible. So the, the Hebrew Bible contains uh, a, a number of uh, verses dealing with war. Many of these are found in the Torah itself, which is thought to be the core of that uh, Bible, the most important section, the foundation actually. Without that Torah, that the rest of it has no ground to stand upon. Now, in the Torah, there are uh, prescriptions about uh, how to go to war. Uh, for example, a prescription that uh, if you besiege a town, uh, then you should offer it terms of peace. And uh, if it accepts uh, your terms of peace, then you force the people into uh, labor. Uh, but if they do not accept, then uh, in, in fighting against them, uh, you have the right to decimate that uh, population. Uh, more so, there are prescriptions, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 13 and Deuteronomy chapter 20, uh, about towns which uh, are given to the Israelite people by God. And uh, they're being told, if you hear that in those towns uh, there are people uh, worshiping other than the one true God, then you should investigate the matter. And if you find out that it is true that they really are worshiping another god, then you should go and kill all of the people. Everything that breathes, men, women, children, and even the animals. And then you gather them all in the open square and light a fire to them all, making that a burnt offering uh, to your god. What is meant by burnt offering? Uh, Muslims are familiar with the sacrifice we do on Eid al-Adha. Uh, or the sacrifice that you do when the child is, uh, is born, for the Akita. Uh, normally, we slaughter an animal, and then the Quran says, you eat from that meat, and you also share it with your uh, friends, relatives, and more importantly, with the poor people. So people eat the meat. So the idea in Islam is that uh, God provided that for you to eat anyway, uh, but on this special occasion, to offer our, our piety and uh, our recognition of God and to give thanks to him for these provisions, we slaughter the animal in a special symbolic way to express our thanks. But the result is the same. 
like other people kill and eat animals, we also uh, kill and eat some animals, uh, on some occasions especially, and we give thanks to God in that particular way. And now, in, in the Torah, the conception often has been, yes, some animals were eaten as well, uh, but uh, often there is the idea of the burnt offering. So, the animal would be slaughtered, and then burnt. Uh, and some of the texts say that when the animal is burnt, uh, the, the smell of that burnt offering goes up into God's nostrils, and God is pleased with that smell. So this is an offering that people are, are giving to God. So now, De the book of Deuteronomy is saying that if you hear in that other town uh, that people are worshipping another god, you should kill them all, and then bring them all in the open square, set a fire to them as a burnt offering to God. So uh, these uh, passages like this have caused uh, many to react with horror, and uh, some have tried to defend the tradition. Uh, a couple of books which I intend to read, but I haven't read yet, uh, are uh, written by uh, a, a, a certain scholar whose name escapes me at the moment. But one of the books is entitled, Is God a Moral Monster? Is God a Moral Monster? Now, he's writing this in defense, and you can almost anticipate that he's going to say no, the answer is no. And Muslims should agree, uh, the answer is no, God is not a moral monster. Uh, but uh, for that writer, the task will be to go through these uh, passages of the uh, Old Testament, in particular, and uh, to show that despite these passages, no, God is not a moral monster. And of course, this is the claim of the other side. Atheists will be claiming uh, this God that you say you believe in, this Yahweh, as he's called in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, in the Torah, uh, this Yahweh uh, seems to be a very violent, angry, and uh, vicious God. And, and they might even use the term, it looks like he's a moral monster, uh, meaning that he does not seem to have any moral basis on which he stands. Uh, so, so this has become a known problem for uh, defenders uh, of belief in God, given the basis of the Torah. Now sometimes we, want, we worry about, uh, and we wonder about the uh, major conflicts in the world today. As you know, one of the major problems that we're, we're facing is the Palestinian conflict. There are conflicts in many parts of the world, but the Palestinian conflict has become really a crux of some other uh, problems. Uh, when uh, 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 America was bombed on 9-11, uh, somebody arose from the ashes and, and uh, said, you know, why do they hate us? And uh, so that there's the question, why do they hate us? And uh, to some extent, the answer to that question goes back to the Palestinian uh, problem. So we need to understand that problem and see its connection uh, with the world's uh, religions and its uh, scriptures. Now, sticking with the Torah still, the book of Genesis, which is the first of, of five books in the Bible on the whole, and the five books which make up the Torah, the book of Genesis says that when uh, Ibrahim alayhi uh, left his hometown uh, at Ur uh, of the Chaldeas, uh, that would be somewhere near the foot of the Tigris uh, River, and he went up to Haran, and then he came down into Canaan, the land of Canaan, and uh, God said to him that God is giving Abraham this land to be possessed by him and his descendants. And of course, there are many passages in the, in the Torah uh, describing uh, this uh, promise from God and uh, giving various uh, ways of delineating the land. And, and sometimes the delineation is that this land is all the way from the uh, Nile River to the Euphrates River. So this is a large span of land uh, comprising a part of, uh, of uh, North Africa, uh, the Middle East, and, 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 you know, so including all like Syria and Iraq and so on, or, or at least parts of them. And definitely including what is today referred to as the land of Israel and uh, what Palestinians know to be their land. So the promise, according to that book, is that this land is being given to Abraham and his descendants. So now, suppose you have an empty plot of land and, uh, and you own that land, and you say to somebody, okay, I'm gonna give you that land. So that, everything looks nice, right? That's my land, I'm giving it to you. Empty land, just come in here and do what you have to do, right? Build your house, 
uh, start farming and so on, you own the land. Everything is good. Nobody's going to complain, right? So take that one step higher. God owns the earth. So God gives this land to Abraham. So empty land, no problem. Abraham comes in, builds his house, starts his clan. His uh, generations uh, spread out. They own the land. They cultivate it. Everything is good, right? Where's the problem? The problem is that there were already people in, uh, abiding in that land. There were already inhabitants there. And the inhabitants are called by the names of their particular identities, the Hivites and Jebusites, and as you might expect, Canaanites, who lived in the land of Canaan, and so on, the Terezites and Jebusites, and, and so on. And so what's to be done with the people already in the land? So now this is a problem. If Abraham and his descendants will inherit that land, what's going to be done with the people who are already in that land. Now it turns out that it will take uh, many generations for what is known as the Israelite people to eventually come from under the domination of the Pharaoh in Egypt, marching uh, across the sea, and eventually coming into the land of Canaan. Now when they come into the land of Canaan, uh, the results are described in the book of Joshua. That, that's also in, in the Bible. It's following right after the Torah. And it seems that Joshua is following the prescriptions which are already mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, which we spoke about previously. And he comes in, and according to that book of Joshua, uh, this is now the successor of Musa, alayhi salam, coming in, acting on the command of God, he goes in and he slaughters the populations one after another. Now historically, it may not have actually happened like this. Historians are reviewing this uh, description, and they think that the whole thing has been exaggerated. But nevertheless, if we ask, what is the moral law? What is being taught in the book here? It, it becomes a real problem for the question of peace and justice because the entire description is in favor of one people called the people of Israel and against all of the other people to the extent that the other people it may be killed off in large numbers, the whole population could be annihilated, and from the point of view of this book, all of this is good and right and fair. Why? Because this is God's chosen people, God has given them the land, and the other people do not deserve to be in the land. Now, there is a piece of land that was referred to as the land of the Philistines. Today we say Palestinians, right? The land of the Palestinians. So it was called the land of the Philistines, and the people were called Philistines. And there was co a continuous trouble between the Israelites on the one hand and the Philistines on the other. The Philistines are holding out, they have their land, the Israelites are battling against them. So the Israelite heroes who are described in the books of the Hebrew Bible are, are heroes who would go and inflict uh, vast uh, amounts and, and hor horrendous uh, uh, amounts of savagery uh, on, on, the palette, on the Philistine people of that time. So again, you see that one-sided situation. The result of all of this description in the Hebrew Bible is that people come away naturally thinking uh, that uh, the whole land belongs to the Israelite people and people like Philistines or whatever you might call them in modern times, Palestinians or whatever, they don't right, they really have any right to that land. Now, the Israelite people his, historically had been dispersed. After the war uh, of uh, the year 66 to 70, when the Romans uh, sacked uh, Jerusalem and drove out uh, the Jewish people uh, from their religious center. So they scattered, many lived in Europe for many centuries, and uh, we know that many were persecuted, especially in the Holocaust, which was a sad event in the history of humankind. And uh, eventually, as sympathy moved towards uh, the Israelite people, and uh, many of the world, world's powers wanted to give the Israelite people a safe haven, and uh, various uh, countries were considered as uh, possible prospects for Israelites to move into and, and start to somehow regain their identity as uh, a connected and unified people. Eventually, uh, the British settled on Palestine, and they brought uh, the uh, Israelites, uh, they opened the doors for Israelites to start to, uh, for Jewish people to start migrating back into 
into what we would call now the land of Israel. The state of Israel was uh, set up, and uh, that state uh, continued to receive support from many of the world's powers, including the United States of America. So now, when uh, people are asking, why do they hate us? This is one of the answers. I'm not saying it's right to hate, and Muslims should not hate people. We should love people, they are creatures of God, uh, past mistakes and so on, we should find ways of going over, getting over that. We want to live in peace, we want the world to be unified, uh, we want an end to violence and bloodshed. Uh, as Muslims, uh, we are ambassadors of our faith, and we want people to open up to our message. So we need to find ways of peace so that people uh, can... Christianity, and then I want to go to Islam, and then I'll take your question. Christianity inherited the Hebrew Bible. So far we call it the Hebrew Bible, we call it the Tanakh, and we call it also the Old Testament, right? So the Old Testament is a name that Christians have given to the Hebrew Bible. Why do they call it Old Testament? Testament means something like, uh, what am I saying in Arabic, Ahad, or, or covenant, or agreement. So they're saying this is an old agreement that God had made with the Jewish people, and now God has made a new agreement with us through the message that came through Jesus. So they call that the New Testament, the new agreement. So now they've put the two into one book, uh, so the books of the Old Testament and the books of the New Testament. The books of the New Testament are 27. 27 smaller documents that make up that larger collection called the New Testament, and then the two testaments are bound together in one book that we may call the Christian Bible. So that means that all we have said already about the violence in the Old Testament are present in the Christian Bible as well. So it's present in the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible, and it's also by necessity present in the Christian uh, Bible. Christians, however, will say that uh, Jesus came and represented peace. They will even refer to him as the Prince of Peace. And uh, they will say that even though such horrific violence was mentioned in the Old Testament, that's not what we go by. We live in peace, and all we want is peace, and Jesus taught us to turn the other cheek. If somebody hits us on one cheek, we turn the other cheek. We're not going to hit him back, but we're going to give him the other one to slap that also. Uh, so we are entirely for, for peace. This is a common message that we will hear uh, from a person on the street. However, the history is a little bit more complicated than this. Uh, first of all, in terms of the history of uh, approaches to peace and violence within the Christian communities, uh, while it might be fine for the individual to have this sort of policy, especially where it seems that it might work, if the stakes are too high, and, and if it's uh, likely that the tyrant or oppressor uh, might get away with with his oppression, if you take this approach, obviously it will not work. Let, let me be more, more straightforward with this. So, let's say somebody is angry with you, and he slaps you on one side. Naturally, you want to slap him back, right? So, but sometimes that's not a good idea. If you slap him back, he's going to hit you harder, you hit him harder, both of you might end up in jail uh, on assault charges, right? Okay, so that's not a good idea. But let's say the person slaps you out of anger, and you say to him, okay, so that's what you want to do? You want to slap me? Okay, go ahead and slap the other side too. So now, maybe he will cool down at this point. Now he will realize that, that you're not violent, and you don't want to attack him back, and he may suddenly realize that, you know, he's wrong. Why did he attack you in the first place? And the first time he attacked you out of anger, but now, uh, once he has already hit you, he doesn't have the same level of anger when you're offering him to hit the other side, he realizes, no, it would be wrong for him to hit you on the other side. Why should he hit you? And now he might think, why did he hit you in the first place? So now you convert his way of thinking by this uh, uh, generosity and kindness and meekness and humility on, on your part. So it, it works. That, that approach might work. But if the stakes are too high, then you may not want to try this approach. Like you cannot say, okay, all right, you killed one of my people, kill this other one too. Because the stakes are very high here. Maybe he will kill the other one. I mean, if in the first case, if the person slapped you on the other side, you, you, you know, you, you, you got another slap, but it's not such a great loss to you, right? Uh, but in this case now, the stakes are high. You don't want to try this approach. Now, in situations where there are tyrants, 
If people do nothing, they do not resist the tyrants, the tyrants will get away with murder and they will commit more murder. And we see it happening on, on a daily basis, even in our present world. So when the stakes are so high, or uh, when it does not seem that that approach will bring about the desired result, uh, then obviously that's not the, the approach to take. And Christians over history have also taken the other approach of uh, resisting tyranny and oppression by going to war. In fact, Christians have done more than this. In the age of the Crusades, for example, and they uh, launched the wars for a variety of uh, objectives, including the objective of uh, defending and supporting and even promoting uh, their faith. And they have decimated uh, large amounts of people, uh, Jews and, uh, and others, and even fellow Christians. In the age of the Inquisition, uh, we have uh, Christians killing each other because they claim that the other are not the true Christians, we are the true Christians. So there have been this approach. But what about the Bible itself? Many will say, well, the Bible itself does not teach us to go to the Crusades. Uh, the, the Bible itself does not teach us to have inquisitions. The Bible itself does not teach us to go to war. And to a certain extent, that is true. However, uh, when, we, when uh, our Christian friends say that Jesus, of whom be peace, is the Prince of Peace, that is only part uh, of uh, this, the true statement about Jesus. Uh, there is an underlying current of teaching in the New Testament uh, that says that Isa salam, whom Jesus, whom Muslims refer to as Isa, the Prophet uh, Jesus, and we say alayhi salam, peace be upon him. There, there's an underlying teaching in the New Testament that Jesus was to be the Messiah. Now what is meant by Messiah in, in the Bible? Messiah can mean one of three things. Messiah can be a priest, could be a prophet, or could be a king. The term Messiah itself uh, corresponds to the Hebrew, to the Arabic term Al-Masih, Al-Masih. And this corresponds to the Hebrew term Hamashiach, the Anointed One. Uh, this term, the Anointed One, uh, refers to the practice uh, uh, among the Jews that when they uh, inaugurated a judge or a king into office, they anointed his head with oil. So they said he's the Anointed One. That anointing of his head with oil, that was a symbol of his inauguration. It meant that this is the person approved by God, now he is in office. Okay, So that's called the anointed one. A sacred object might be anointed with oil and, and, and desi designated to have something to do with the worship practices of the Israelites. So that is considered something sacred and holy. And it's called the anointed thing. It could be a rock that, that is anointed with oil. Some people think Messiah means God. And when they refer to Isa as Messiah, they think that means we are saying that he's God. No, Messiah doesn't actually mean God, neither in English nor in Hebrew, uh, nor in Greek. Christos is, is, the, is the equivalent in Greek, which they shorten for, as Christ. It does not mean God. So it could mean a Messiah, as the term applies to Isa salam to Jesus, could mean either that he is a, a prophet, or that he is a priest, or that he is a king. Now. The Gospels make him all three. He's everything. He's prophet, he's priest, he's king. More so, they make him the king son of David. Now they're referring back to Dawud who was spoken about in the Old Testament. And Dawud was one of those who were fight, fighting against the Philistines. Now, Dawud was a king, according to that Bible. And he was uh, the model king. So, after his son Solomon, the kingdom became divided and people always look back to the time of Dawud when the kingdom was united. <coughs> so he was the ideal king. But before long, the, the Israelites came to be dominated by other people. One after another, until the Israelites were taken into captivity into Babylon. So they always, now in captivity, they long to go back to their homeland. And they long for a king like David. And in their books now, we have statements written by them during this period, obviously, in which they are saying that a future king will come who will be a descendant of, a descendant of Dawood, of David. And that future king will bring back our glorious days. That future king will do away with the enemies and institute what they refer to as the kingdom of God, the law of God on earth. So the Torah, which contains many laws, 
The Jews could not implement because they themselves are in captivity. So almost like Muslims living as a minority uh, in one of the uh, developed countries. You cannot implement uh, Islamic law, pure and simple, where you live because you don't have that authority, right? Where Muslims have the authority, they can implement their classical Islamic law because they have the authority. But where Muslims are not the lawgivers and lawmakers, they, they don't have that authority to implement Sharia law. Uh, they can only follow the law of the land wherever they live. So a similar situation with the Jews. They are in captivity. What are they going to do? They have a book of laws, the Torah, but they can't implement it. So they are hoping uh, for a king to come who will do away with all of these uh, uh, foreign occupiers and implement the kingdom of God and the law of God on the land. They refer to that future king as the son of David. Now, the New Testament is written about Isa alayhi salam. And what does the New Testament say? It says that Isa alayhi salam is that son of David. He is the son of David from beginning to end. And uh, he goes about himself also claiming to be this, according to this New Testament. So what does this mean? That means that he will be a king. And he will do what kings do, fight against his uh, oppressors. Sure. I have uh, not much time remaining, so if you have questions, start uh, um, compiling your questions, write them down, hand them over to the ushers so that we'll get to them. So to continue then very quickly, uh, and I'm going to end this lecture soon, they, they want a king who will be the son of David, who will remove the foreign occupiers, even violently. But obviously, Isa a.s. did not do this. But there is an expectation that he will come in the future and he will do precisely that. The book of Revelation is the last of the 27 books of the New Testament and therefore the last of the books of the entire Bible, right? That's called the book of Revelation. This describes uh, the return of Isa alayhi salam of Jesus. And specifically in Revelation chapter 19, uh, Jesus is uh, shown in an imagery that he will have uh, a... a sword coming out of his mouth and with that sword he will slay his enemies to the extent that his uh, uh, his garments will be uh, drenched with blood some may think that that means the blood that he shed on the cross of crucifixion but no the imagery here is actually the imagery of a conqueror who conquers his enemies he slays them and his uh, garment is uh, draping in in the blood of the enemies as he wades uh, through the uh, crowds of uh, fallen bodies. And it said then that he will rule with an iron rod, which means with a very strict rule. So there is that undercurrent of teaching in the New Testament that represents Jesus on whom be peace, not necessarily as the Prince of Peace, but also a, a man of war. And, and so we find the interplay of these two very, very aspects that we talked about from the beginning of the lecture and we see playing out in various religions one after another. On the one hand, there is an emphasis on peace, and on the other hand, there is an allowance also for violence to deal with the realities of the world. Finally, now in conclusion, let me get to the religion of Islam, which is the last of the world's religions that I wanted to consider in this lecture. And it's the youngest of the world's uh, most uh, major religions uh, in terms of historical chronology. Islam has a sim similar interplay uh, between peace and war. On the one hand, there is a strong emphasis on peace in the Quran. Uh, the Quran tells us uh, that we should, in fact, uh, enter into peace completely. In the second chapter of the Quran, in the 208th uh, verse. And uh, it says that even in the time of war, if the enemy were to incline towards peace, then fajnah laha then you should also incline towards uh, peace because that is obviously a desirable goal. The Quran does not like war. Uh, the Quran uh, uses uh, the term war often to refer to what the enemies are doing. They start the fires of war. So, Every time they start the fires of war, God puts out that fire. So you see the imagery here of other people trying to start a war and God is putting out the fire. And we, being the helpers of God as Muslims, we want to do the same thing. We want to put out the fires of war. This is the Quranic uh, teaching uh, for Muslims. At the same time, the Quran wants there to be uh, peace with justice. 
Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Uh, uh, in, in the United States uh, uh, struggled for the rights uh, of, of people. And he said uh, there they can be no, no peace without justice. In fact, he wants justice. It's not enough to say, okay, let's all live in peace and some people are suffering from injustice. Uh, some people have to rise to defend uh, the oppressed ones. And so we find in the fourth chapter of the Quran that there is an allowance, even an encouragement to Muslims. Uh, Quran is asking Muslims, what's wrong with you? That you do not rise up to defend the, uh, the, uh, the oppressed people, the men, the women, the children who are crying out to God and saying, أَخْرِجْنَا مِنْ هَذِهِ الْقَرِيَةِ الظَّالِمِ عَبْلُهَا Take us out from this, uh, this town uh, in which the people are so oppressive and, uh, and send us somebody who will help us uh, against these uh, oppressors. So often we look around at many of the troubled spots in the world, we look around at, and we observe uh, the uh, oppression and we uh, hope that somebody who has the power will step in uh, to remove the oppressors and to save the oppressed people, but often the powers that we uh, do not move until they see some personal interest uh, for uh, themselves. May God help us all. And uh, so what often happens uh, is that uh, uh, people without proper authority, they enter into this sphere thinking that they will become the defenders of people who are suffering elsewhere. So some Muslim youth sometimes take it upon themselves, thinking that they are supporting the Muslim people, uh, they will go to war, and they will bring about the justice which uh, the world powers are failing to bring about. So even though many of their methods are wrong, uh, some of them have good intentions in that they see that there is wrong being done, they want to help the oppressed people. They want to help the oppressed people in Palestine uh, and, and in many other parts of, of the world. And uh, they see that many of the world powers seem to be uh, aligned against the, the side of, of justice, and so they see them uh, as the enemy. And because those world powers have uh, the conventional uh, means of armament and, uh, and uh, military might, uh, the, the youth who are trying to support Islam in this particular way, they resort to what is known as guerrilla tactics. And guerrilla wars have, in the history of the world have been fought like this. Uh, we spoke about uh, the classical Chinese thought. Uh, one of the books that came out of that period of Chinese thought about war is a book written by Sun Tzu, entitled The Art of War. Uh, that book, though it deals with military strategy, is being studied in modern times in boardrooms uh, in America. Uh, the, the corporate giants are studying military strategy to be used in uh, the sale of products. So how, how do they... Um, uh, position themselves as corporations, how do they take over other corporations, how do they get a bigger market share, and so on. They're studying the strategies of, of war, described in that classical ancient Chinese uh, text. So, that Thai Chinese text also describes guerrilla tactics. Uh, how do guerrillas fight? When, when, you have, uh, if, when you have the military might, you go forward in formation, and uh, you call the enemy to come forward. But if you don't have that uh, ability, then you don't even go to confront the enemy who's calling you forward. You attack from the sidelines. You stay in hiding. You launch an attack. You go back into hiding. When it looks like you, it's advantageous to launch another attack, that's when you do the, the next one. Sometimes your goal is to, to decimate the enemy. But sometimes that goal is too big. You know you can't do that. You want to inflict some harm. Uh, and to, in order to let them know that you're still alive and you're still there resisting them. Uh, they are causing you a lot of hurt and uh, sometimes you just want to be a thorn in their flesh uh, to cause them some anxiety even though you know that you cannot win. Now I don't recommend this strategy for our Muslim youth. I see this as a dead end path and uh, dead end path, you know, it's, uh, uh, the sound of that even, having said it and I hear it, I realize how true it is. It is really a dead end uh, path. That's not the path we need to go uh, into. We need our youth uh, not to die for Islam, but to live for Islam. In our present times, uh, we see many opportunities open up uh, for our Muslim youth uh, to serve the world in general, and the Muslim people in particular. And uh, these opportunities are largely available to people with education. Now I'm delighted, as I mentioned in the Friday's prayer, that the Ontario government with its new budget is uh, going to give uh, free post-secondary education uh, to children of families uh, with an income uh, combined of less than 50,000 
dollars. I think this is good news for many newcomers to the country who are struggling to make ends meet. Uh, our, what I want to see is our Muslim youth going into education, yeah, getting education in very many various fields so that they become uh, influential in the various fields and then they will be able to use their influence as persons, as individuals, to show what it means to be a good Muslim uh, in that field. And, and also, uh, they will be able to use their influence for the good and, and to influence good policy making in whatever field of endeavor they are, because they will have an influence on their colleagues, their thinking will be part of the process, and if they are respectable persons in various fields, then their thinking will affect the outcome in various uh, fields. So there are many different ways in which uh, the Muslim youth can contribute uh, to the betterment of the Muslim population and Muslim countries and uh, in the, to the countries in which they live. And this is what I recommend, not the kind of dead-end uh, guerrilla fighting uh, program which we know from history and which we see does not really uh, go anywhere. So then, in short, to wrap up this lecture and to conclude and to get to your questions, the uh, world's religion uh, cannot uh, be totally separate from violence. Because violence is there built into the fabric of humanity. As long as human beings have been around, they have been violent. Even the Bible says that Adam had two sons. One was Cain, one was Abel. And uh, Cain killed his brother Abel out of jealousy. So as long as there is this human inclination like jealousy and there are other kinds of inclinations of a negative sort, there will be violence. It's not because of religion, but religion is trying to curb that violence, to encourage peace. And to say that even if you happen to go to, uh, to uh, enter into violence, you should enter it into a in a disciplined way, in a way that uh, evokes justice and decency and fairness, and that you don't go killing wantonly. So Islam in particular is against the killing of civilians. So when somebody says that he's fighting a guerrilla war in the, uh, in the uh, name of Islam, and he's killing civilians, he's doing it wrong. He's doing something that is absolutely haram, and he should not be doing that. People have done things in the name of religion, thus giving religion a bad name. But in surveying the world's religions, we have seen that uh, basically the religions uh, encourage peace and uh, discourage uh, war. I thank you all very much. Salaam alaikum. Thank you very much, Dr. Shabir Ali. So, uh, thank you all for being such a great audience this evening. Seems to be a little bit of feedback. Um, so. At this point, this brings us to an end of the talk session, and this will bring us forward to the Q question and answer portion for tonight. Um, if you guys have questions and, you, get, and um, you haven't written them down yet, just wave your hand and we'll have one of the ushers come around. And